without further ado, please welcome Laurie to up here. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to uh, to ADAQ, and um, also a welcome from the um, Association for Laser Dentistry, based in Australia, the AALD, of which, for my many sins, I'm the current president. Um, so this is like a, a co-hosted event in laser education uh, for tonight. It's part of an association linked to the ADA, where we're meeting tonight. So it's important to uh, to thank and acknowledge them. So I'm going to talk tonight about where the CO2 laser fits into clinical practice and then Peter will talk about some of the underlying science behind what the laser does to tissue so you're sort of going to see the same story but told from two different parts so, uh, so for me you know this story begins in the 1960s not long after lasers were invented they were used surgically and the CO2 laser was certainly the platform laser for the beginning of oral surgery with lasers, dentistry, plastic reconstructive, dermatology, neurosurgery, and general surgery. And I got involved in working with lasers in the late 1980s. And then when I came back to Australia from the US in uh, 1991, uh, began to own uh, my own CO2 lasers, including what were effectively the precursors of the system that Peter will talk with you about uh, tonight. And uh, earlier today I was showing Peter my original user manual from way back uh, in those early years of 1990. And that platform and size or format of laser really continues on today, but with some additional modes, particularly the super pulse mode that Peter will spend a bit of time talking with you about. So having used this thing for well over 30 years, the thing I've really liked is really fast cutting that's bloodless and it's very, very simple. To, to do very, very quick and efficient cutting. In terms of sheer power of ablation, there's almost nothing that will beat a CO2 laser when it's used properly. So I'm gonna sort of give you some examples of how the tech has changed. So when I began, the, uh, the laser panel looked like this. The laser was that large. It was absolutely enormous. And even the smaller dentalized versions were that big. And they had tubes that were made out of glass. And today, you know, we've sort of moved on from tubes that are made out of glass into ones that are made out of metal. For a whole range of different practical reasons, they're actually better. So the first laser I had that was built in Seattle was the same sort of footprint or format. It looks very similar to the one that we've got, um, got today. The second one I had, again, looks in the same sort of general style and format with this flexible hollow waveguide to deliver the energy to it. And that was then in the next two CO2 lasers that I had, whereas combined with some other wavelengths. And then I sort of strayed and used another type of operating theater type CO2 laser. And then of course, there's the system that we've, we've got tonight. So there's sort of, if you like, a little bit of a family history over a long period of, uh, of three decades. One of the most important things though is, is the way you sit and work with it. So if you look at this picture here, which was taken in 1991, here I am sitting comfortably, here's the flexible hollow wave guide coming down. We're doing some surgery on a organ transplant patient in this case. It's a very, very small compact laser. You compare that to this picture over here, you can see here's the articulating arm from the uh, quite a large laser coming down, basically over my shoulder and behind my head. So, a different sort of working position that's a much larger, heavier laser, and the footprint is bigger, as you can see from this diagram here. Now, Peter will talk with you about the modes, but one of the big differences from the early lasers that I had, as shown on this little control panel, to what's available today, is the ability to run the lasers in super pulse mode, which dramatically reduces the carbonization and therefore increases the speed of cutting quite dramatically. And it's almost like sort of an accelerator or a turbocharger when it's used properly. Uh, one thing that we did a lot of in the early 90s was to really push the boundaries of where these lasers could be used on teeth, on dentine, on cementum, on root surfaces. And there's a whole range of different studies which, which we published about those things, including things like desensitizing and pulp capping and pulpotomy and so on. And these were applications which at the time were very, very new and exciting applications for lasers in dentistry. But they're not the dominant thing that people use a CO2 for. They use it for soft tissue surgery, shaping tissue around teeth or around implants, 
converting the surfaces of ulcers into wounds that heal very quickly, altering the patterns of epithelium in periodontal sites, doing procedures like vestibuloplasty or phrenectomy or different forms of pre-prosthetic surgery. You know, as a recent graduate, I really avoided pre-prosthetic surgery, but with a CO2 laser, I got to really like it and find it really fun. And I know it might seem a strange thing, but it was one of my great entrees into treating patients who were exceptionally old. And uh, that was sort of to eventually lead to uh, my later career in life. And along the way, I removed lots of, uh, lots of lesions of different sorts, which was really good fun. Many general dentists use them for, you know, shaping tissue around a tooth, you know, to get rid of a sub subgingival margin. Very simple and straightforward in a patient who's well, but in a patient who's medically complex, to be able to control bleeding is really very useful and very important. So this laser routinely gives you complete control of hemostasis, but it will actually handle up to some um, fairly good size um, bleeding vessels. The ability to sculpt tissue artistically, to landscape it back without leaving any lines on the surface, is so important and the tissue heals so well. Between this photograph here and this photograph was only four days. You see how beautifully the epithelium has come, come down on top and another four days later you can see how that's healed but also the, the lower area that's been treated has also healed so well. We published a number of studies in the mid 90s on how CO2 laser wounds heal in the oral mucosa. But we've seen them in thousands of patients, this rapid coverage of epithelium over these wounds without patient discomfort. Even in patients who are medically compromised, where we laser the, the tissue away, but in a short time, we've got this beautiful epithelialized tissue. In this example here, we've just ablated a mucus seal and chased out the salivary gland and we don't have any scarring or visible change after a week. It's really quite remarkable. And we've published some very big retrospective studies looking at an experience of laser surgery involving hundreds and hundreds of cases over many years, looking at these very low rates of post-operative complications and pain. And then of course in the special needs area, treating patients with uh, overgrowth caused by medicines like cyclosporin, you know, to go from this to this, sitting in you know, a private office dental chair in less than 20 minutes with half a mil of local anaesthetic versus having a general anaesthetic is really quite a difference in complexity for, for the patient. Or treating patients who've got overgrowth caused by anti-epileptic anti or other sort of medicines. Around implants, this laser is extremely good because around 90 plus percent of the energy reflects off the titanium surface. This is partly because of the longer wavelength. So you can scallop tissue around implants to shape it ideally. You can get rid of excessive tissue around implants and it heals remarkably well. Even when the implants are placed in unusual places, such as this one that uh, a well-meaning uh, general dentist placed about another 10 millimeters further buccally from the external oblique ridge, almost into the patient's cheek. Now how they wanted the denture was going to connect to it, I don't know, but we were able to clean the tissue up and keratinize that bed of tissue to make it very effective. Treated many cases of peri-implantitis, ablating this tissue away and decontaminating the implant surface. It's a well-described laser application. Pre-prosthetic surgery, getting rid of things that shouldn't be there, like excessive flaps of tissue, like large nodules of fibrous tissue inside the lower lip or big flabby ridges that shouldn't be there. All those things are actually not technically difficult things to do. In the land of phrenectomies there, in adults, there are a range of different cases we've treated in conjunction with speech pathologists to treat people who've got all sorts of uh, oral, oral functional and speech defects. This patient's got a fairly classic uh, inverted tongue over here and that's been uh, released with the CO2 laser and you can see that along there very, very well. So its ability to do this very, very quickly and without bleeding is a very important, config important configuration advantage of this particular laser type. And here's another one, this time in a, a younger child. This, this girl's about eight years old and just a very nice release of a fairly obvious issue there.
but it's only one of many things that you could do. You can scallop soft tissue around teeth having orthodontic treatment, as we've done here. Or we can uncover teeth, as we've done here, to basically deglove this small premolar tooth to make that accessible. We can remove lesions and then use the laser to basically tidy up the site to seal it down, as we've done in the case of this little papilloma, just inside the lip. Or this peripheral giant cell granuloma in the lower arch, or uh, this plasma cell lesion in the middle of the lower arch where we basically removed it with a conventional biopsy and then used the laser to scallop the surface so it heals at that same rate as you would get with a normal laser wound. Extremely useful sort of thing. And then take it up to a more serious level. In this patient where we had biopsy established uh, that this was quite a severely dysplastic lesion, we can scallop off a very large area of tissue and yet in a week's time find perfectly normal mucosa there. That's a very, very good application. And we've done some massive procedures, this is a little tiny one, but this ability to scallop tissue is extremely useful. And if you look through the uh, applications that are approved for this laser in the US, you find all these different sorts of things I've mentioned to you are all listed as approved applications for this sort of laser. And that's been the case for many, many decades. This is nothing that's particularly new. Peter will talk with you about what makes this particular laser system a bit different from other sorts of wavelengths and in terms of the way that the tissue warms up with different sort of wavelengths. That is the reason why the ablation is quick, but as Peter will explain to you, also what's happening in terms of heat inside the tissue is quite a different process. But for me, the things that I like as a user of sort of 30 years experience is to have a very small operating spot where I can quickly ablate tissue and I can do that without touching it. I'm not scratching or scraping uh, along the tissue. I'm working off the surface with a very high precision with normally about a millimeter, a tenth of a millimeter of interaction, good control of bleeding, very little contraction or scarring. A very simple requirement, I can just wear my normal loops with side shields and I can work, I don't need anything that's special. My patients can wear glass or polycarbonate. I don't need window blinds because glass absorbs the laser. Under the uh, 2018 Australian Standard 4173, you don't need blinds for a CO2 laser. You can pick this laser up. It doesn't make much noise because it hasn't got a big complex heavy cooling system. And I'll show you the handpiece in a moment. But these have got some really neat features, including some idiot proofing features, like a beam stop. So you cannot blast through, for example, someone's uvula and hit their nasopharynx, or their posterior pharyngeal wall, which if you're doing surgery around the soft palate is a really good thing, let me tell you. Uh, that could be an issue. This laser comes in a range of different, different powers, and while you might think that you know, 20, 20 watts is a, is a lot. Many procedures that are done surgically in dentistry don't use the maximum power of this sort of laser. They actually use modes where the instantaneous power is greater. And you deliver it through different sorts of tips. And I'll show you some of the tips in a moment, but there are tips that have got little disposable ends made out of a luminous ceramic, which you can put in, and ones that have no bits which basically tipless hand pieces but which focus down to a spot. I like to think about these as the knife and the trench in very simplistic terms. Do you want to cut a neat little slice or do you actually want to cut some sort of trough? And by changing the distance from the tissue we can alter the interaction very very easily because we're only working a couple of millimeters off the surface which is very easy to do clinically. Strangely enough, the way the panel is currently laid out is actually reminiscent, as you can see, of the way the panel actually was, you know, 30 years ago. This was all, you know, physical buttons that one used to push. But now, of course, there's lots of modes and other features built into the, the touch panel. And most importantly, this different mode of super pulsing, which really revolutionizes the way that you use the laser as an ablation tool. Now, you know, I've used you know, 20 different laser wavelengths over my career, and each laser has a particular personality that's partly the wavelength and partly the 
piece of equipment itself. So just to sort of summarize up, what, what would I say is the personality of this laser? Well, first thing, you're using an almost point blank range just off the surface, one to three millimeters. And you're holding the handpiece with a grip like a pen. So you don't actually need to aim because you're almost exactly on the surface, but you're not touching it. So you don't pick up little drags of tissue like you might, for example, with a diod laser. The waveguides are quite long and they're very, very light. They do need to be calibrated so you know what the performance is, but the laser tells you what that performance number is. With a CO2, you don't deliberately laser enamel because if you do, you heat it up to about 2000 degrees and it starts to undergo a number of conversions in phase. It goes a bit white, and you can create some subthermal sort of stress. The sort of modes that we would be using for surgery, we would always want to protect the, uh, the enamel surface. Similarly, you wouldn't want to be lasing restorations that were things like posterior composite because you'll actually ablate them. So you need to think about two surface protection. The beam being in the far infrared reflects off things that aren't necessarily shiny because the wavelength is very long. So something which looks perhaps a bit matte, could actually re reflect the laser. And if you've ever read H.G. Wells' War of the World and you've learnt about a Martian heat ray, that's a very good description of a CO2 laser beam. An invisible heat ray that just goes from place to place and starts fires. So if you're testing out the laser on something like a piece of paper or a dry tongue depressor, it will set it on fire. That's what it will do. So we always use a wet tongue depressor, particularly in theatre, where we're checking you know, the laser's performance. That will always be done with something which is wet because it will start a fire, absolutely. So just to finish up, a couple of little things about to the tips. The tips come in all different sizes and shapes. When I began using uh, this laser 30 years ago, there was basically one size, but now there's a range of different sizes some of which are very, very small, which is great for very, very small, delicate procedures. And instead of having just one handpiece design, which was this one, now there's a range of different ones with different spot sizes, which are engraved on there, so you don't have to remember what they are. But also there's a few which have got these idiot-proof features, which is basically a little beanstalk. So when you're lasing through the tissue, which is here, the beam will then collide into the back of this. So it can't cut too deep, which is a very useful feature for surgery around the soft palate, as I mentioned previously. So my default handpiece that I would pick up with this laser would normally be this contra-angle handpiece because this will go most places and do most things for me. So it's, it's sort of my universal go-to handpiece. But there are handpieces of this laser which have variable spot size where you can basically dial it up if you want that control. And while it might seem uh, fairly obvious that a straight one would seem the easiest one to use, actually most of the time, I can tell you from experience, the contra angle is the way to go. It just sits more naturally in, in our hands because of the way that the energy is delivered, and particularly around teeth. It's just an ideal shape for sculpting around uh, gingival tissues. So finally, there is um, laser safety training available for this through ADAQ. It is a course uh, which I teach as a remote course. So if you go to the ADAQ's uh, CPD online events, so when you go to ADAQ, there's a section for the profession. You'll see there is um, presented courses and there's also self-paced online courses. So when you click on that, you're looking for the one which is called multi-wavelength laser training which then steps you through all the things you need to do to get a laser use license that will apply in Queensland and the other regulated jurisdictions like Tasmania and Western Australia. But it's actually a good thing to have in all parts of Australia because it gives you a lot of those fundamentals about what's actually happening inside the tissue. So there it is, a bit of a sort of a run through sort of from a more of a clinician standpoint about the sorts of things that I've found about using this laser system for many, many years on thousands of patients. And I guess the reasons why it's, for me, a really good laser, both when I was a general dentist and then later as a specialist, I've always found this laser very, very useful. So um, perhaps I might take some questions after Peter's had a chance to talk with you and then we can sort of answer questions together if that, if that works. Yeah.
Thank you very much. Yes, thank That's you. Good. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. Thank you. Yes. How about smell? Oh, just CO2 laser. So the smell of the CO2 is exactly the same as the smell of a diode laser um, or electrosurgery. It's just the production of plumes. So you'd always have your high velocity evacuator there. And um, I always always tell the patient if they smell anything like smoke, it's the assistant's fault because the assistant <laughs> should be right in there with the suction hand. Yeah, the patient would normally never smell it. But yeah, you do have to capture the, the plume. That's true with all lasers. But um, yeah, especially with a, a diode or a CO2, anything which is cutting where the tissue is dry, you always get some, some plume. Yeah. But you should you should never smell it. Yeah. You always use a high velocity pancreatic. So yeah, that's good. That's good. Can you comment on the use of anesthetics? Um, yes, I've had um, a number of CO2 surgical procedures done on myself, and when we did the study of uh, wound healing, I think I went through something like 30 um, procedures without local anaesthetic um, in the mouth. Um, it hurts. <laughs> um, so we would always use anaesthetic. Often we use just-in-time anaesthetic, so micro-injector, a couple of uh, microliters of anaesthetic just to blanch the tissue. Done a lot of surgery doing that. We've also used, in some cases, diode lasers to block the pain receptors and then done the surgery. So to sort of hybridize two different things, you use the diode to block the, uh, the ion channels in the nerve and then do the CO2. So we've done some procedures like that and that's actually worked reasonably well. But just straight up front, um, a, a CO2 will hurt uh, because of the way it's interacting with the tissue as Pete described. So it's quite different um, in that way from some other sort of laser types. Um, but you're essentially trading off a number of things and if you've got a micro injector or using a wand or just you know, 30 gauge needles basically, you can give quite painless anaesthetic in lots of places and then you can work really quickly. So we would normally only give her enough LA to last for a couple of minutes, not for like hours or anything, just literally one or two minutes. That's why just enough to blanch it and then I would zip it off. And then you can actually move around different parts of the same mouth. The patient's quite quite comfortable. So could you um, could you comment on the, the darkness that you might see after after a procedure? The uh, the charm. The charm. A bit higher on the surface. Yeah, um, that d d depends, as Peter said, whether you're using super pulse mode or continuous wave or not. A little bit more with uh, continuous wave. Um, we would always get a a saline moisten a sterile cotton roll and just basically give the surface a bit of a wipe down, which sort of leaves it a sort of faint yellowy brown colour which is a little bit more pleasant. If you don't do that and you leave that material on the surface, it's quite loosely attached, which means it'll fall off. And the patient might notice that it does taste a little bit like um, burnt toast. <laughs> so that's what I found when I when we did our wound healing study in the early 90s. So yeah, we would always wipe that off. So we wouldn't leave a patient walk out the door with things that looked black. Mm. It'd always be a nice sort of, sort of gentle, sort of yellow brown would, would be the norm. So yeah. smaller, smaller, yeah an impact of, of the patient comfort rather than a healing or a Yeah, and we, we, and we always tell the patient that that's a nice thick layer. It's going to be very difficult to dislodge it or bump it. It will basically seal the outside out, keep the inside in. And uh, those those wounds do really well. It's a very comfortable wound, wound bandage and it won't be dislodged by normal function, which is really good. So, yep. so it's very different to when you see charring from a diode versus charring from the CO2, the depth of penetration is very different. Different. Yeah, it is because what happens with a diode, if you um, use a thermal camera, for example, you can actually see that the tip, once it's initiated, is running between um, 800 and 2000 degrees. And I've got some um, some great pictures that uh, one of my orthodontic trainee students, when we photographed his work, he was pushing the glass tip of the diode laser against the enamel and melted the enamel surface. That takes two 2000 degrees to do, which is a great illustration how hot the glass tip actually gets. If you look at the tips on the microscope, you can see the glass melts and fuses. So it, it is a hot tip. That's how the, that's how a diet actually works. It's boiling the cells as it's going through the tissue. Um, if you looked at some of the videos that Peter showed, that the laser's over here and the tissue is just erasing in front of the beam without contacting. So it's, it's quite a different experience. And that also means there's less bacteremia because you're not physically touching the tissue at all. It's, almost like a totally hands-off procedure, which, which is really good as well.
I've never used it in 30, 30 years, never. Um, we published two big case reviews of many hundreds of surgical cases, and we only had two which were basically procedural misadventure, but no, never. Um, no post-procedural mouth rinses, no analgesia, no nothing. I, I, always, I always tell patients um, it'll, it'll look brown until the mucosa begins to change in the mouth that's normally, uh, most tissues one to two millimeters a day. And I say wait the day after it turns pink and you can start brushing it. And that's normally about the fourth or fifth day depending on, on how big the wound is. So, but no, it's very simple wound management afterwards. You don't really need to do very much at all, which is very simple. Can you comment also on suturing? Can you um, use? Yeah, only when I use the the CO2 laser to actually raise an incision. So if I cut if I cut down to that and use it, you might have noticed that the incisions on the videos they're all self-opening incisions. They actually peel open, which is actually really neat. So I've done a fair bit of flap surgery using the laser to cut the initial incision so it peels open. However, at the end, um, before I suture the edges together, I'll always give those wound edges a little bit of a rub to make sure there's some small bleeding because it's that blood which then forms if you like the biological seal at the two wound margins if you don't do that and if your patient's a smoker and they go outside after your surgery and they begin smoking then you actually get a post-surgical wound infection if you don't do it. it's happened to me once in 30 years but it can happen so i always make sure that if i have cut an incision with the laser which is a non-bleeding incision at the end i always oppose the edges and give them a little rub before I put in the mattress or the interrupted sutures at the end. So. Yep. Has there been much research on CO2 and perimplantitis treatments? Um, quite, a, quite a bit. So originally um, the work which was done in Italy focused on actually uh, decontaminating the surface and basically just getting rid of um, all the biofilm, just basically blowing it off the surface and then sort of re-sculpting around the tissues. We published quite a few case series on just essentially correcting all the soft tissue anomalies after then. Um, there's a number of studies, in fact the very first one uh, was ours in the Journal of Oral Implantology in 1992, <laughs> um, which was basically talking about the interactions of the laser energy with the implant surface and going into the dynamics of reflection and how much energy basically bounces off versus how much gets absorbed, which is quite different according to different wavelengths. So if you're using um, NDAs or Erbium or something, the reflection ratio is very different, so the absorption. So that, that makes a big difference as well. Because the longer wavelength, when you put a CO2 on a nano a nanostructured implant surface, um, like a current um, Strauman or SLA type surface, the reflection dynamic is extremely strong because the wavelength is longer. So what the wavelength sees, one of a better word, is a surface which is smaller than the wavelength dimension, which means it basically looks more or less flat, whereas you take a shorter wavelength, you're more likely to get there's some non-linear interactions when the wavelength runs into the surface. So uh, we presented a bunch of research on that about seven years ago, where we showed different laser wavelengths in the near infrared, middle infrared, far infrared range on implant surfaces. Uh, we've had a few students do their theses on it, so we studied it in a few different ways, so yeah, pretty, pretty well understood, I think. Same thing applies with um, laser welders. So if you want to weld something to metal, you need to get, the, get it to absorb. So those wavelengths are inherently going to absorb well and melt the metal. So you probably don't want to be using those in the mouth. So similar sort of story there too. And do you see this laser as one um, that dentists can can use to do more work that they would normally refer off to a specialist, so biopsies or you know different soft tissue things that they normally just go send it off to the specialist because I don't want to see that much blood. Do you find do you find that you would take on more of that type of work removing? So so when I was a general dentist, um, the probably the best example of that was pre prosthetic surgery. So pre prosthetic surgery, I would just add put in the too hard basket. Never really liked it, enjoyed it. Um, couldn't see why I would do it. And then when you've got this, it's like, oh, that flabby tissue, you know, that distal free end bed, you know, this sulcus isn't deep enough. Those things you now see because now you've got a solution that you can do and you will revise that. And so that changes the way that you program the way that you do 
um, dentures, implants, those sort of things, because now you can modify the the tissue bed that you're working. You're not sort of stuck with what you inherited, and that does that's that really made a very big difference. Um, and similarly, uh, most most people hate doing submarine dentistry where you're subgingival, there's blood everywhere, there's fluid. You're going, oh my gosh, what can I do? Well, then you don't do submarine dentistry anymore. Now you you change a margins position, you drive the side up, all those sorts of things. You just shift the paradigm of how you work to make it easier.